Okay. Um, there's no running involved, by the way. I just like Kate Bush. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I'm going to run through the I how the idea came about and how some of the initial findings and um, came about and finish up with some lessons learned. Um, so a bit of background. I'm an archaeological consultant. Apologies. <laughs> I've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, I manage a small uh, team in um, Bristol, and we primarily produce DBAs, EIAs, and we manage field work through ACAR roles. That's really exciting. <laughs> uh, I'm based in, um, uh, in Bristol, as I say, but when COVID hit, um, I started to work from home. And I live in the Chew Valley, I'm very lucky, uh, which is halfway between Bristol and Bath, so about 10 miles west of here. Having my hours reduced and not having to commute gave me the chance to explore the heritage in the valley. And the first place I visited was an obvious choice of a hill fort, which overlooks the village where I live. So I'm coming at this from a, a long-term consultant's perspective with very little experience of community projects. Um, and I thought this would be a, a good opportunity to talk about where some consultancy skills <laughs> Um, might be adapted to, uh, to help with similar projects. So in my experience, consultants rarely get the opportunity to get involved with community projects because uh, nobody likes us. Um, so having some, some free time as a result of COVID has been a, a way to uh, engage with the local community. And most importantly for me, um, I've got young kids in the local school. They don't really know anything about the heritage of the area. It's not it's an untapped resource, so creating a sense of place is, is, is the most important thing, really, for me. So this is where we are. Where is it, too? In local parlance. Uh, the site's 10 miles south of Bristol and about the same west of Bath. The hill fort is on the northern edge of the Mendips on a spur of Carboniferous Limestone overlooking the River Chew, uh, which is to the south. And it's that river that was dammed to create the Chew Valley Lake in the 1950s. In May 2020, I started to research my local area with a view to visiting sites. Uh, to save my sanity, I wanted to get out. Um, and uh, during uh, lockdown, um, I wasn't able to, so I got on the Baines Know Your Place website, which is uh, absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, along with the HER records for the Hill Fort and some detail contained in a Historic England management plan, um, I, I, I you know, found some early mapping and some interesting information that suggested the whole of the plateau, which is this triangular area, um, could be quite archaeologically rich. And uh, it includes a possible nematon, which is you know, quite exciting, really quite rare. Nematon is a sacred grove, Celtic, Celtic name. Um, but also an 18th century poorhouse, which is virtually unknown. Um, so on this image, uh, it's taken from Henry Rothwell's uh, digital digging website, you can see how the hillfort sits on a promontory, um, sort of out towards the west, with a, a hollow way leading up to it. Uh, and to the east, there's this triangular plateau covering around 100 hectares. The evidence for the possible nematon comes from historic field names, which are um, Nimblet, they're called. There's several fields to the east of the hill fort called Nimblet. And uh, one of these is an oval banked enclosure which surrounds the highest point of the plateau at 107.75 metres AOD. So I'll talk about a little bit more about these in a bit. Um, so while this is a, a relatively small area of 100 hectares or so, it, it was clear that the whole plateau had quite a lot going on with good access through the, the whole, um, to the whole area from the byway, which runs through the centre of the site. Um, the site overlooks very rich landscapes, particularly to the north and south, and to the south there is an extensive and well-preserved uh, medieval field pattern, and to the north we have um, Chew Valley Lake, which was the site of one of the very first rescue excavations in 1955. Um, so the site seems to represent a possible opportunity for heritage interpretation. As I say, it's you know, new territory for me. Um, but creating that sense of place through a heritage which is otherwise missing. So the Chew Valley Lake is a, a regional leisure destination and uh, it's very close by. And uh, I think that it's a real opportunity to connect the Burlage sites, this plateau and, and what's going on here, with the Chew Valley Lake. So the um, 
there are some really interesting archaeological sites under the lake. Um, there's no interpretation at all anywhere if you go and visit. Um, the excavations in 1954-55 were led by 34-year-old Philip Ratz, who's pictured here, and uh, with the help of Ernest Greenfield and Arthur App Simon, all of whom became very respected archaeologists. And Philip Ratz, of course, became a professor. The, um, the excavations revealed a third century villa and uh, early and middle Iron Age farmstead, uh, Bronze Age cremations, and a possible Neolithic structure. So, possibly the most significant artifacts are the, the wooden writing tablets that came out of the well. Um, I believe they're in the British Museum. They're, they're, apparently, this is, this, these were decipherable. I don't know what they say. <laughs> so, moving back over to the, the site, the Burlage site, um, this poor house, uh, just to touch on this, um, this is a photograph of the location that I put together. The, the east rampart of the hill fort, which still exists to the, the south of the byway, that's the byway that runs through on the left there, um, that eastern rampart was flattened in the 1950s, but originally continued all the way across to a um, bit behind where the poor house is on this picture to join the northern ramparts. Um, and interestingly, there's a, there's a currently unrecorded Holloway um, leading up to the hill fort from the location of the mm -hmm. villa. So that's not on uh, any records at the moment. So the 1840 tithe map on the, on the top right here shows a small building in red with an attached garden. And the apportionment documents records this as um, a poorhouse. So the building is not shown on any later mapping, um, but it is recorded on the Baines HER. Uh, but there's no, no detailed information at all. So parish poorhouses were either purpose-built or um, they, were, they were repurposed barns, quite often with the chimney just tacked onto it. And, uh, and for that reason, they, they regularly burnt down, you know, as if life wasn't hard enough. Um, <laughs> So this was the poor house for Chewton Mendip, and the parish boundary is actually the north rampart of the hill fort. So it's as far away from Chewton Mendip as you could possibly get. Um, so it would have housed one or two families and paid for by wealthy parishioners uh, through involuntary contributions collected by an overseer, which was usually the church warden. Um, and when the 1834 poor law was introduced, this is probably built or uh, taken on as a poorhouse in about 1750, uh, but in 1834 things changed and these poorhouses stopped being used and everyone was moved into the larger workhouses. So very few people seem to be aware of this poorhouse and I, I think, you know, it's a great opportunity to investigate and a, a really important piece of social history tied to the Industrial Revolution and the effects it had on the, on the rural poor. I mean, my thing's prehistory, you yeah, know, and that's my interest, but so this was a bonus really. But it's there somewhere underneath where the ramparts have been flattened, could be quite a deep test bit. This is a scheduled site, by the way, it's within the scheduled site, this. So the, the really exciting and kind of new stuff, really, is, is the nematon. Um, so although there's widespread evidence for nematon place names, such as Nempit and Nimblet in the southwest, um, there are similar names also throughout the British Isles. Um, but groupings are rare, um, as are associated earthworks. So of particular interest is this oval enclosure that we've got within these nematon fields. Um, it's defined by a low bank, it measures 200 metres by 93, and it surrounds the highest point of the hill. Uh, there's also a well or shaft feature visible on the LIDAR, you can see a little black dot on there. And um, you can see it on the ground as well, you can see where the hedge dips down. So it's, this enclosure is an unusual feature in the local landscape, uh, ideal place for a wicker man. But, uh, but the 1973 version, not the 2006 version. <laughs> um, but I have to be careful because Nick Cage is actually a local, apparently. So. Yeah, he lives in Bath. Um, to the east of the Nimblet Fields is a ploughed out bank, which looks to run along the whole entire sort of wide edge of this triangular plateau. Um, that's this, this wide bank with the, the red arrow pointing to it. And it's interesting how that curves into the trackway as well. So. You know, these are all things that would be great to have a look at and would make a great community project. It's got a, a closer view of that banked enclosure. It's a satellite image from the dry summer of 2018. It um, appears to be cell-like parch marks. It's the only satellite image trawling through them all 
that had anything on them. But, you know, there, there might be something there. I don't know if you can see that, the scale, but uh, sort of cell-like um, parch marks that could represent archaeology. Um, also, that well or shaft, you can see how the, you know, the bank changes slightly there. So we're only to undertake some geophysics in here in um, June. And um, fingers crossed, I persuaded my company to come in and do a little trial with their geophysical... They don't do archaeological geophysics at the moment, but I'm hoping that they'll, um, they'll come in and use it as a bit of a trial. Uh, so I'll get it for free. But, um, <laughs> but, but, but we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So moving back to the Hillfort, in 1955, Arthur App Simon, who was actually helping Philip Ratz with the lake excavations, Moved, uh, moved up to the hill fort for, for a bit, bit of fun, or light relief, I don't know, but he went up to the hill fort and, and dug 29 test pits. Um, and um, the pits located within that red circle there were, were really quite productive, and you can see on his interpretation that we've got pits, and um, it's quite nice for the time, you know. Um, you know, good depth of archaeology. And there are some photographs as well, so you can see in the test pits that... There's, there's a really good sealed horizon there. Uh, but really importantly is, is the pottery is said to be early Iron Age, nothing later. It's all early Iron Age. So have we got an early Iron Age domestic site within a hill fort? It's quite rare. You know, lots of hill forts, 4,000, but not so, not so common to get single phases that are quite early. So I thought I'd better check this out. Whoops, how do I go back? There we go. And um, got a grant, small grant for geophysics in 2020. And you can see that Arthur App Simon was bang on with his test bits. You know, he got the right area, which is the lowest point of the hill fort. And there are nine, ten, maybe more ring ditches, including one very large one in the southwest corner there, which could be a barrow. Um, and there's a, a coaxial um, field system, probably Bronze Age, there before the, the hill fort. And then there are various other sort of uh, areas of pitting, um, one of which on the very highest point of the hill fort, the, an area in the north east corner, it's quite intensive. So, you know, is that sort of grain storage or excarnation platforms, that sort of thing. But, um, yeah, um, but based on that, you know, we might be jumping the gun a bit <laughs> with this. But, you know, it was locked down, so, uh, <laughs> so I got the crayons out. Um, yeah, so there's lots of potential for hidden heritage uh, at the lake and, um, and the hill fort. The hill fort is that high bit of ground in the, in the middle of the photograph there, looking across the lake. Um, a community project could create a real sense of place here and uh, lead to some much needed heritage interpretation for the lake. Uh, so one of the first targets uh, driven by a community project might be um, this new round the lake walk and the purple bit's already been built. Uh, no heritage interpretation at all on this. And the green bit is planned for the next few years. So I'm hoping to, you know, get involved with that and see if I can get some, you know, the villas right next to the walk. So there'll be, you know, plenty of opportunity there. Um, yeah, the south section of the walk would pass very close to that villa site. And you'd be able to see the hill fort as well, all the way um, round it. Okay, so where did I start? Um, you know, I, I, when we were trapped and we couldn't get out, I, I, I looked online and read everything I could on setting up a community archaeological project, you know, new, t new territory. Um, so there's loads of re recent guidance, of course, and project websites like Dig Ventures, as, you know, I, I had a look on there. Um, lots of things to, to look at and cherry pick from. Um, and, uh, and then I wrote to the local history societies and uh, local researchers. And, uh, you know, everyone's been really positive about it. Um, clearly, any excavation within the Hillfort would require SMC. So I, I'm not obviously going to get that without demonstrating potential to contribute to national research. So I needed academic advice. Um, and in my experience, consultants and academics don't, you know, need much need to, or desire, actually, to interact. Um, for, <laughs> for, fortunately, <laughs> my day job introduced me to some really helpful people at Cardiff University, and that's uh, Neil Sharples, um, Oliver Davis, and Richard Madgwick, and they, they, they've been great, you know. Um, and Jodie Lewis and Gail Boyle, as well, at Bristol Museum, were very helpful. Um, 
so yeah, a um, few hurdles. Um, yeah, that, that is actually the bull that lives within the fields on the hill fort, isn't it? Nigel, his name. <laughs> yeah, I had to convince the landowners, so that was the, once I'd sort of got my head around the potential to, to maybe do something, and if I had the, you know, the ability to maybe pull something together. So I went to see them, uh, Jill and Graham Nicholl. Um, they were not very keen. They were really not very keen, because one of the advantages of the, of the site its accessibility, this, this byway that runs right through it, was also a bit of a hurdle because it was a byway, it was just that, it was a um, byway open to all traffic and it was just abused, it was, um, you know, this is bearing in mind this is going right through the middle of the scheduled monument, so it was wrecked and um, it, ten years worth of this and it, it driven them mad and they didn't want anything to do with the general public um, at all, they just wanted to look after their land. So that all changed. Uh, Historic England got involved and um, there's a temporary stop on that now and bikes can go along it, um, you know, trial bikes, but um, not vehicles. Uh, and some people still jump the gates, the livestock's in there and, uh, they, you know, they're farmers, so they're, they're pr very protective of their land. But they're on board now um, and um, they become, they've become very supportive of it, uh, not, not least because... They also have other charitable interests, um, and I've suggested to them that archaeology actually, you know, could be a way to raise funds for, for example, a church, a local church that they um, help out with and they're trying to raise money for. So archaeology, you know, they can make their land work, I think, for, for that purpose. So, um, yeah, aims. Um, so this is all taking place over a very challenging time, but... Uh, now things are starting to come a bit easier. Um, we, we want to try and undertake the first stages of the pro project, uh, beginning with investigations into the Nematon this year. So geophysics, test pitting, um, and alongside this and subject to a, a SMC, I might get some pits where the poorhouse is as a community project. So it's combining the two, the academic and the community elements. Um, I haven't mentioned how all this is going to get funded. Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, Car the guys at Cardiff are pretty confident that there's, a, there's you know, ways and means. So summarise, uh, what started as a casual interest driven by boredom, effectively, uh, during lockdown has started to become a proper research and community project. Um, so it's very early days, but getting the landowner on board and with lots of encouragement from interested people, it started to take shape. Depending on the upcoming geophysics, we are going to be... Um, looking at the non-scheduled areas of the Nematon, and then um, hopefully we can provide a solid research agenda for the hill fort, and uh, the aim would be to look at that within a couple of years. Um, and we'd be looking at portfolio funding for, for this, this work. So as a consultant, you know, effectively I've worked as a middleman, you know, my experience with planning projects and pulling together various elements uh, from different sectors has proven really useful. And uh, while I've had to step outside of my comfort zone, it's certainly been very rewarding. And I, I, I could say with the best will in the world that I would not have had the time to start a project like this if it wasn't for the pandemic. So in that sense, it has been quite a rewarding couple of years. So I've gained some valuable new perspectives, and um, I would have struggled to find these through my day job, where uh, I view blinking as a, as a break, really. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I, I would definitely encourage others with similar backgrounds to have a go themselves and uh, I'm sure that we'd all agree that um, more than ever pulling our collective skills and working together more to keep public interest alive can only be a positive thing. Thank you.